Mankind is a failure. Those were the words proclaimed by the Father, as his ever-faltering faith in his creations finally gave way to the mercy of oblivion. They were filled with a regret that lay deep, deep within him, because he knew that not only had man failed him, but that he too had failed man. He let his curiosity get the better of him, and now he could no longer control what he'd made. It had become too dangerous, too powerful. So he would stay back, let it fester, because he feared what would happen if he were to try and intervene. He feared death. But how did things end up here? How could something possibly be so terrifying or formidable that even God feared its power? Well, it all began during the final war, a human conflict that, unbeknownst to them, would give rise to the very things that would bring about all of this chaos. The machines. They were initially created to aid the parties fighting against each other in that fruitless war, but quickly became obsolete due to one major discovery that led humanity to truly understand the senselessness of their conflicts. Hell, a place whose existence was never thought to be verifiable by living souls, was unearthed by man, and its foretold atrociousness stood true. It was a place where countless souls were subjected to eternal punishment, even for actions that could simply never warrant such torture. This revelation was such an awakening for humanity that it caused an abrupt end to the final war. In its place, a period of everlasting care for human life emerged, aptly named the New Peace. People finally began to realize that their petty violence was not worth the suffering that would come in the afterlife. Despite the humans' extensive efforts to shield themselves from eternal damnation, their fate had already been sealed. Before the climax of the war, during year 2112, plans for the mass production of a new machine were set into motion. This prototype machine was named the V-Model. It was carefully crafted from a desire to outperform even the best of human soldiers in combat. As a machine, it could show no emotion, no remorse, which made it able to quickly and flawlessly carry out its executions. The only similarity between it and human soldiers was the need for blood to function. Although strange, this design choice was very reliable and efficient, as blood was an abundant resource in the environment of war. The concept was so reliable, in fact, that every machine built during the final war made use of it. But the V-Model wouldn't just utilize the concept. It would revolutionize it. Unlike its mechanical brethren, it would be capable of refueling lost blood during combat. To accomplish such a feat, the V-Model would use a new exterior plating that would be able to attract, catch, and transfer airborne blood into the machine's fuel tanks as it moved around the battlefield. This was much more efficient than the lengthy, completely separate refueling process that the other machines needed because the ability to mend itself mid-fight meant that the V-Model's endurance would be insurmountably superior to everything around it. There was one downside with this new plating, however. It was quite thin, which made the V-Model's defenses very poor, meaning, given the right firepower, it would be destroyed easily and instantly. Now, that fact by itself might make the use of this plating seem like a very big risk. But there is one specific reason that the material was not disregarded. 
Because the plating was so thin, it was also very lightweight, which would allow the V model to move at incredibly fast speeds. It would be capable of evading most, if not all, attacks, so no heavy hitters would ever even come close. This, in combination with its profound regenerative capabilities, would make the downsides of being so fragile almost disappear. Overall, the genius behind the V-Model made the engineers question the designs and usefulness of most other machines. That excitement didn't last long though, because the treaties that led to the establishment of the previously mentioned New Peace were signed in the middle of the V-Model's prototyping phase. Thus, its remaining plans for prototyping and mass production were cancelled. But the engineers behind this technology didn't want all of their hard work to go to complete waste. So, they began work on a newer, more humane version of the V-Model, dubbing it simply the V-Model 2. By extension, its predecessor was labeled the V-Model 1, but these two machines later became more commonly known as just V1 and V2. With the V-Model 2, the goals the engineers set for its design were more focused around peacekeeping rather than killing, as there was no use for such violence anymore. Even still, the machine was built using blood as its only fuel source, though this was no longer efficient. The engineers knew that, but they had no choice, because their very limited budget kept them from committing to such drastic changes in design. To compensate, they decided to revert to using the standard plating for the machine's exterior shell. Not only was it more affordable, but its durability was objectively more useful in times of peace, as opposed to the niche abilities of the fragile, special plating they had developed for the original V model. As a result, the newer plating became totally irrelevant and was discontinued from further use. Additionally, as if the engineers didn't already have it bad enough, once the first prototype for the V Model 2 was finished and it was first presented, it attracted such little attention from investors that it never left the prototyping phase either. Because of its completely obsolete design origins and the irrelevance of war, it just had very little purpose now, and for most investors that problem presaged total failure. Another issue was that these V-models were very expensive in both production cost and purchasing price, with a single unit costing around the same as 50 small security drones. For those seeking usefulness, the V-Model 2 just wasn't gonna cut it, because for much cheaper, they could get multiple specialized machines that would serve the same purposes. So unfortunately, no more effort was put into the V-Model project, and both designs were completely abandoned. Accepting total defeat was something that the engineers didn't plan on doing though, so in one last ditch effort to make some kind of profit off of the few machines they prototyped, the choice to sell to collectors was made. After finding some, they managed to make back only a small portion of what they spent on the production of the machines which wasn't at all the outcome they'd hoped for. On the bright side, however, huge opportunities for all seemingly obsolete machines built during the war would open up soon after the discovery of Hell. The organization behind the development and construction of all the machines used during the final war is the same one that is responsible for Hell's discovery. Its true name is currently unknown in the lore, so we'll just call it Ultratech. Ultratech was a highly classified research and experimentation organization whose sole purpose was to exceed the limitations of modern technology. Their unending curiosity led them to begin researching the many aspects of Hell, as well, Ultratech would repurpose many of their machines by using them in what were expected to be very dangerous expeditions. At first, everything was a complete mystery. Even just finding a way around the place was a more daunting task than anything this organization had ever pursued. Normally, transport between the layers of hell relies on the ferryman, 
But the project leaders at Ultratech never discovered this, and did not try to make use of the phenomenon as a result. Instead, they started development on their own system of transport. What they envisioned was a complex interconnected network of operational hubs which they called the Elevator Room Terminals. These terminals would be capable of transferring physical material as information across a radio signal, which other terminals could then receive and use to reconstruct the sent object. As well, they could be used for communication between the explorers in Hell and their overseers back on the surface. With this, Ultratech had the perfect setup to eventually utilize their new technology across all of Hell. At least, that would be true if it weren't for one significant factor. These people had no idea what they were getting themselves into, and their lack of preparedness for potential dangers in this new world was about to become a detriment to their success. Suddenly, machines were malfunctioning. Doors were uncontrollably locking workers inside of various rooms of the mining facility, but worst of all, these strange husk creatures would be trapped in there with them, usually resulting in the death of those trapped inside. No one knew what was going on, nor could anyone find the cause of these disturbances. Well, almost no one. I've figured it out. I know why the creatures are suddenly and undetectably appearing inside of our facilities. I know why spare parts and pieces of machines keep disappearing. I know why the doors seem to malfunction and suddenly lock themselves. It's not a glitch in the system. It's... Hell is alive. It breathes. It thinks. It is a massive, intelligent superorganism, and it is harsh. And it is cruel. Just by watching us, it has learned how our systems and machines work. It has not only begun to deconstruct our technology, but also reconstruct it in perverse ways, attaching parts to the creatures it tortures, making them into an aimless army of death and destruction. It warps them across itself to get them past our security. It locks our doors to trap us with them. It's not an attack, nor is it a defense. It's entertainment. This is an exhibition of death and cruelty and suffering for its own sake. It grew tired of what it had, and we unwillingly offered ourselves up as its new playthings. Tom, please, for the love of God, cancel this project immediately. We have to abandon everything and seal this place away. Leave the machines and tools behind. Evacuate as many as you can before it's too late. I can only hope that this encrypted message is moved before the organism learns to read and intercept it. Whatever happens, we can't let this thing find a way out and spread to the surface. We have Another dies. Bring me more. I hunger. This was the final message of a researcher whose name is unknown. It was clearly sent to warn Ultratech of its fate, but more specifically, it was directed at a man named Tom. This individual was a lead executive at Ultratech. He held great power and influence in the company, so only he or someone like him would have the ability to bring such an expensive project to a screeching halt. By the time he had received the message, though, it was already too late. In a panic to save the remaining lives of those still exploring, orders were given quickly and with minimal explanation for all expeditioners and their accompanying machines to evacuate. Everything else was to be completely left behind. All that mattered was that Hell could not be given the chance to take any more lives, nor to spread to the surface. And so, the expeditioners who were trying tirelessly to open the gates of Hell were forced to stop and hastily reseal the cracks they'd made. And as begged by the message, all other projects involving Hell were marked for abandonment as well. The only things that were left standing after the fact were the connections the surface computers had with the terminals and machines that were left behind. Though Tom knew, deep down, that it wasn't the smartest idea to stay connected to those terminals, having witnessed firsthand the capabilities of the monster below, 
He just couldn't beat his own curiosity. He decided that Ultratech would continue to study, but this time from afar. Unfortunately for them, they didn't realize just how cataclysmic of a mistake this was. While leaving behind everything that was generally valued less than human life and sealing the gates to hell seemed like enough to keep its might at bay, the desire for knowledge and power would inevitably allow it to prevail. All the networks of terminals and hordes of machines that were left behind would serve as catalysts for Hell's growth in intelligence and strength. And being as evilly selfish as it is, Hell would find a way to entertain itself, even if it meant destroying the world in the process. Ultratech's perfect setup for taking control of Hell had been totally eradicated, and now that Hell knew how to reach the surface, it was only a matter of time. Not long after the initial evacuation, the worst began to see the light of reality. At first, the signs were small, starting with a total loss of communication between the surface computers and the elevator room terminals. Hell had blocked the signals so the humans couldn't study it while it used their technology to improve itself and strategize. The higher-ups at Ultratech, having almost no understanding of such capability, looked for a way to fix this problem. It was during this period of search that they acquired a major investor, a company whose name is also unknown. So we'll just call them the Donor Company. This mysterious company had taken interest in Ultratech's efforts to study Hell, so to help out, they invested lots of money into research for equipment that would help to re-establish the connections that Ultratech had lost. After a few months of some killer engineering, this powerful new communication equipment was built and working. As planned, it allowed Ultratech to reconnect with some of the high-end machines that were left behind. Although Hell noticed these new connections, it couldn't immediately do anything about them because the technology the humans were using this time was very different. So, the researchers were able to begin studying the environments and other machines for changes. In the time they'd spent researching and building the connection equipment to do so, things had changed quite a bit. The researchers observing specifically the terminals noticed something quite phenomenal. They, alongside the other machines, seemed to now be sentient, as they had developed this entirely new social hierarchy system to cure themselves of what the researchers identified as boredom. What was really happening here, though, was the result of the terminal's connections with the surface being cut. Since Hell had blocked those connections, the terminals could no longer receive new data, meaning Hell had limited information to mess around with, and as a result, it grew bored. To combat this, it cleverly schemed, with its knowledge of the human's tech, to create a new form of entertainment for itself. It would use the terminals to lure machines into a symbiotic relationship. The way this relationship worked was the terminals would reward machines with varying amounts of points, or just P for short, when they would bring back and submit recordings of their battles. The higher the entertainment value of the footage, the greater the number of points received was for the participating machine. Those machines could then use those points to buy things from the terminals, like high value materials or even better weapons that they could use to make their battle footage more entertaining or stylish. Eventually, the terminals even gained enough data from battle footage to simulate their own arena. This arena was called the Cybergrind. It was a safe, simulated environment that the machines could connect to and safely practice combat without the threat of actual harm. A machine's performance in the Cybergrind was graded in a lot of the same ways that its regular combat footage was, with the only key difference being the addition of a record value meant to be updated as the machine improved, or simply, a high score. This was gold for Hell, as it not only provided it with live entertainment, but it also allowed for more of it, because machines wouldn't truly be damaged or destroyed while battling, meaning they could easily just hop back into the simulation when they were defeated. The researchers didn't exactly know how all of this was possible, but they believed that the reason these terminals and machines were able to behave this way was because of the blood that fueled them. 
They thought that somehow the organic fluid was granting them some sort of sentience, when in reality it was just hell playing with its new toys. These strange phenomena were not only being observed by humanity, though. A pair of watchful eyes with a status so high and so mighty had seen everything. Not only had humanity doomed themselves, but, too, the fate of the world. The father roared with anger and disbelief as he watched the sinful humans destroy the world he had made for them. He had had enough this time. Mankind had gone too far, because not even he could stop them now. What they had just created would be the end of everything. The apocalypse. And how fitting it was for the one thing God regretted creating to be the one that would destroy it all. The father, in his defeat, spoke one final phrase. It was then that, with no warning, he abandoned the world. The Archangels of Heaven felt the death of a great power inside of them as their leader disappeared into an eternal absence. They could no longer call to him. They could no longer feel him. The light was gone. God was gone. The impact was immediate, with the Kingdom of Heaven falling into complete and utter chaos. The Archangels didn't know what to do. The only thing they could think of was to keep everyone safe, and so they recalled all of their Wardens from Hell without second thought. With no presence from the heavens above, Hell was free. Nothing was holding it back anymore. It's time had come. With God gone, and the human world as vulnerable as ever, Hell seized its chance to take hold. Through the new connections the humans had so carelessly made, it began to spread itself throughout the cables within Ultratech. The computers, the lights, and the security systems were all shut off. The workers panicked as they scrambled to repower the building and get the security systems back online, because without the proper networking guards, the machines were uncontrollable. But that's exactly what Hell wanted. Shortly after the outage, the government agency responsible for communications with Ultratech noticed that every single system they were supposed to be running was offline. The agency knew this could spell disaster, so they called in the military to secure the area and investigate. But there was no time. Hell had already done all it needed. With its mass spread into the machines, they were under its control now. Almost immediately, the machines activated and started targeting every person around them. There was nothing that people could do but watch, helplessly. The screams of many and the firing of bullets could be heard from every single corner of the building. Blood began to paint the walls, and within a matter of minutes, every single person inside the building was dead. They were murdered by the same machines they used to kill so many in the war. But after Ultratech was stripped of any life, the machines quickly began to enter the streets, open firing at every single human in sight. It didn't take long for the military to arrive with the most formidable teams and weaponry they could manage. They fought hard to subdue the chaos, but the attempt was futile. Most of the soldiers were killed off quickly when faced with the power and numbers of the machines exiting the building. And unfortunately for the surrounding city, the military had also brought in their own machine soldiers to act as reinforcement. They did anything but. Hell took advantage of the humans' try for might, and it updated its own machines with new instructions. 
They were told to disrupt and turn any opposing machines to Hell's side, almost like zombies spreading a virus throughout the wires of man's remaining mechanical children. But these zombies were smart. They had a plan. As the swarm spread throughout the city, continuing to relentlessly kill, two smaller groups of machines branched out and infiltrated two specific buildings. One group took hold of a government broadcasting center, and the other, a satellite station. With all the necessary pieces of Hell's plan now connected, the world began to weep. This is not a test. I repeat, this is not a test. A national emergency has been declared by the United States government. Emergency action is required for all citizens. A massive horde of military-grade weaponized mechanical soldiers is currently open firing at seemingly any person they come into contact with in the city of... It is unknown what is controlling these machines, or how many more of them there might be across the nation. All persons are urged to stay inside and lock all doors and windows to prevent entry from intruders. If you have a safe room, or any room with strong or protective walls, it would be best to gather your surrounding persons there. If you have any weapons in your home, it would be best to keep one close for defensive reasons. It is also recommended that any devices with transmission capability, such as cellular phones or radios, be turned off, as these machines are attracted to most signals. This broadcast will be updated with new information in... Please do not turn your devices back on until then. The broadcast was a believable fake, giving out absurd but reasonable instruction, and leaving out key information that people would panic without. Even still, most people saw it and did as it said without much hesitation, shutting off any device with communication capability and effectively isolating themselves from the rest of the world. The threat of genocidal machines running around God knows where was enough to keep rational thinking out of the picture. It was perfect. The machines were not attracted to the phone or radio signals, though. Hell only wanted them gone because, without them, people couldn't fight back. They couldn't call for help. And those that didn't listen and kept their devices on, well... They didn't have much time anyway. It's day two of the blackout. I think something's here, watching me. I've been hearing strange noises outside. Something's wrong. There's something they aren't telling us about all this. The sun was supposed to rise three hours ago, but it never did. Whatever caused that broadcast, whatever caused all of this, it's more than just those machines. <gasps> what the hell? What the? You there. Thanks for watching. I really appreciate it. Now here's a meme. Meow, ooh, ooh. Uh, ooh, ooh, meow. I thought I farted, but I definitely shitted. That meme was brought to you by my amazing supporters, Unfocused Gamer and Chosta, Costa, I, uh, whichever one. Sorry about that. Since you made it uh, this far in the video, I'm gonna assume you liked what you just watched, so don't forget to hit that like button. Also, also, let me know what you thought of my story. I feel like MatPat after all the theorizing I had to do to make it fit together. It was really fun though. Oh, and uh, you should watch one of these. They're pretty good, just saying. All right, bye-bye now. Adidas.